This right. meeting is being recorded. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, this is our very first SEL speaker series event of the 2022, which is unbelievable by the way, 23 school year. Um, we are really excited to have you here. I'm gonna turn it over to Greg Graber, who is our Director of Social Emotional Learning to talk a little bit about what SEL is here at Lausanne and what the program is. And then I will introduce our speaker tonight. So Greg, I'll let you chat about that for a minute. Thank you so much, Amber. I, Justine, I appreciate you being here and I appreciate everyone who is attending tonight and or watching the recorded version. Um, this is the third year that we've had our SEL program at Lausanne, and we're continuing to make strides in developing program and engaging our students and our faculty in these kind of great initiatives that really build up their emotional intelligence skills. This is the first year that we have formalized a curriculum um, into the upper school. We started with ninth this year and every subsequent year thereafter. For the next three years, we're going to add a grade until the programming is K through 12 at Lausanne. And I'm really excited again. I know Justine is back by popular demand. Um, what she talks about really is it encapsulates what SEL is all about. And uh, we are delighted to have her here. So thank you, Amber. Awesome. Thank you, Greg. So. Um, just a couple of logistics things before we get started. Um, everyone knows how to use Zoom, I feel like at this point. I feel like um, we've spent the last few years doing this, but it's actually such a great thing because we can have amazing speakers come who don't have to come to campus, who don't have to travel, who can share what they want to um, share with us. We can have discussion with them without them being here. So Everybody knows how to use Zoom, and I just want to remind everyone, again, I'll probably keep my camera off for quite a bit of this just because of internet issues. Um, if you were on our campus today, you experienced those with me, um, but I will be here in the chat, and I also will be here checking on the waiting room. If you get kicked out, if you have a question, if you need anything, please put it in the chat. Please feel free to come and go. I will be here kind of monitoring the whole thing. So um, with that said, I'll also make sure that if you are watching this um, live, you'll also get the recording later this week. And I'll put the recording up for everyone and send it out to everyone who registered as well. All right. So without further ado, um, I am so delighted to have Justine back this year. Again, by popular demand, um, her talk was fantastic last year and also was has been watched so many times. Um, she is the Senior Associate Director of the Office of Undergraduate Admissions at East Carolina University. I thought I had a long title, so we might be in competition here. Um, she does a ton of stuff there. She has over a decade of experience and she directs recruitment and outreach for admissions while also planning events and activities for um, for the school, both on and off campus as part of the admissions team. She served in a ton of roles before this, um, Director of Scholar Selection at the Moorhead Kane Foundation, Associate Director of Merit Scholarships at Duke University, Associate Dean of Admission at William & Mary, which is also where she earned her PhD in Higher Education Administration in 2016. She completed her dissertation on college choice and the campus visit. She has a lot of other degrees. She's done a lot of other cool stuff. You've read about it if you registered for this, hopefully read websites before you register for things. But what's really important is that she is a proud graduate of Lausanne Collegiate School. So she's class of 01. So we're delighted to have an alum back tonight. Um, she's gonna talk to us about emotional intelligence and college admissions. Justine, with that, I will turn it over to you. Awesome, thank you so much, Amber. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, here we go. So hello and welcome. Thank you all so much for joining me, whether you're joining me live tonight or um, virtually later. I'm thrilled to have you with me today. Um, I wanna to talk about two important issues to me and to my career, emotional intelligence and college admissions and how they relate to one another. So, um, from finding the right fit for college to navigating applications, 
Now more than ever, emotional intelligence is crucial for college admission and for thinking about a student's next step in their career and their trajectory and in their life. Today, we're going to discuss how to cultivate emotional intelligence and apply lessons that we've learned to college admissions, to future careers, and of course, to lifelong learning. This is a real photo of me as a child, just dreaming of college. Um, I had an older sister who dragged me along on many college tours, and I was fascinated by the idea of getting to choose all the things that you wanted to study, to really focus on a major. Um, I absolutely loved my experience at Lausanne. I attended Lausanne from kindergarten through 12th grade, um, so I absolutely loved it. I think I have the highest loyalty there of any school, but I was really excited about the idea of like like just picking a major and thinking about my career and how I wanted to take classes to kind of help me to gain all of my career goals. So I wanted to share just a little bit about myself just to introduce myself more to each of you. Um, again, I'm Justine Okerson. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, um, but I've had a lifelong of experience at the beach. I grew up visiting the Outer Banks with my mom since I, I was a young girl, and I've been going back ever since. My mom actually retired in the Outer Banks, so to say that we're big fans of the beach in North Carolina is an understatement. I currently teach yoga at the rec center at ECU. I've taught a number of places throughout my career thus far. Are, but I absolutely love fitness. My mom and I are obsessed with playing mini golf. We hope to play every mini golf on the East Coast. So that's a lifelong goal as well. Um, where I'm a big fan of brunch. That's my absolute favorite meal of the day. And then last but not least, I love to travel. So I think travel really enriches your soul, teaches you about different cultures and traditions, different people, opens your mind up to different possibilities. Um, and this summer coming up, I'll be going to Portugal and Italy. So I'm very excited about that. But um, we did mention a little bit about my research and my educational background. I attended the University of Virginia as an undergrad. I got my master's and PhD at William & Mary in higher ed, and I'm currently pursuing an MBA. To, so to say that I am a lifelong learner, I think is, is pretty fair. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about what I learned when I was doing my dissertation and my research at William & Mary. Um, so I was really focused and fixated on how can I improve the campus visit experience for students. Um, I felt strongly about William & Mary and the student experience there, and I wanted to do a better job of communicating that to prospective students and family members. And since I was actually doing that job and in that role, I felt like I was in a really good place to do the right research to kind of help make a difference and make a change. So almost every paper that I wrote leading up to my dissertation was about the campus visit to really help me to better understand the phenomenon itself. So the conceptual framework for this research study was kind of taking a lot of things into consideration. So first is social constructivism, right? The, the concept that human development is socially situated and that it's really communicated and constructed through interactions with other human beings. Then there's cultural capital, um, the fact that assets that you have might pr promote social mobility. Then there's phenomenology. So that's the study of a phenomenon, et cetera. Um, so thinking about the campus visit and the actual application to college as being a phenomenon to be studied. And then last but not least is the idea of college choice, how a student makes the decision to attend um, and ultimately enroll in a certain institution. So I was looking at how all those factors kind of came together to play on the influence of the campus visit on college choice. And so we know that there's a lot of influences on college choice. Family members make a big difference. Places that they tell you, oh, that's a great school, or I went there, or, I it really loved my experience. Your peers. Um, I remember when I was at Lausanne, I had a peer tell me, I went to this dining hall when I was on a visit, and the people said, oh, the students here are super snobby. Um, and so what your peers say matters. So all these things help a student to kind of navigate their own path and think about what college is gonna be a good fit for them. Um, my school counselor was instrumental in my college application process and helping me to decide where I was going to apply to college. We know the rankings make a big difference um, for, for many students. Uh, thinking about this school versus that school and how the school might produce a better outcome. Uh, thinking about the way schools communicate, right? If a school is coming across very cookie cutter, they're not telling you things that are special or unique, 
Um, they're not sharing those institutional characteristics, like the traditions that I had growing up um, as a Lausanne student. I felt traditions were going to be so important to me in college. So a school that doesn't have a lot of built-in traditions and meaning and events that are specific to them were, was going to be a big deal breaker for me. Um, one of my favorite things and experiences in my time at Lausanne was having our principal kiss a pig. He lost a bet and he had to do it on stage. It was incredible. Uh, but things like that, again, really kind of make you bond to an institution and to a place. Um, students have to think about where they're going to fit. Um, if a student really loves you know, skiing and snowboarding and winter and sweaters and s'mores, they're probably not going to be happy at the beach in Florida um, and vice versa. So thinking about those fit characteristics. Um, it's important to think about what makes you happy in a town. Are you going to be sad if you're not close to concerts? Are you going to be sad if you don't have Target or you can't get home easily? Do you need to be close to an airport? All those things make a big difference. Um, institutional actions. So I think especially in the age of COVID, seeing how an institution reacted to a national pandemic, um, to seeing how students' schools reacted to um, different social justice issues over the course of the last few years is also really telling to a student today. I think Generation Z is even more focused with how people are responding um, to outside things, um, and they want their brands to kind of communicate messages that they align with. And then last but not least is just additional influences. So other things, maybe social media, um, lots of different ways for students to kind of get an impression about a college and think about what's going to be a good fit for them. When I was doing my research, I was backing it in three different theories and theoretical models. The first one was kind of the economic side of things. So thinking about outcomes, thinking about what kind of financial gain a student can get from an institution, but also thinking about it on the other side, the more practical side. What are the finances looking like? What resources do I have to spend on college? Um, am I gonna be eligible for financial aid or scholarships? What kind of networks could help me financially after college at a specific institution? Next is the psychological theory, um, thinking about reputation, pride in the school, the influence of others, all those things kind of making a difference. And last is the sociological. Um, so thinking about social attainment, social status, social norms that are specific to an institution or to a place. We know that those can vary so drastically in the United States as well as internationally. So thinking about how those are going to fit in is really integral to many students' plans of where they're going to attend school. So when I started my dissertation, I ended up doing a three-pronged approach. I really wanted to get to the bottom of what things mattered in the campus visit because all of the research to that point said it's the campus visit that makes the biggest difference, but no real backing or further knowledge beyond that. So I was kind of left with, okay, but what is it about the campus visit? What things are great and what things aren't great? What things make an impression? So I ended up doing interviews with brand new college freshmen in the first month to two months of their time at their chosen institution across the mid-Atlantic. I did my own campus information sessions and tours. I listened to the questions families were asking. I took notes on what the tour guides were saying, on what the admission staff said, and what things kind of came out of those visit experiences. And last but not least, I did open-ended surveys for high school seniors who had finished applying to college, but were waiting to find out where they were admitted before actually making their application and matriculation decisions. So all three of those things kind of came together to help me to kind of really figure out what it was about this phenomenon of college choice and the campus visit that made a difference and made a big impact. So here are the things that kind of that I found in my research. Students want to feel special. They want to feel included. They don't want to feel like a number. Um, certain elements of a tour or a visit or an email can really stand out to a student. Um, if an admission staff is particularly friendly, if a tour guide connects with them, um, they want to feel special. Next is that material should be school specific. Um, material that comes out that's like, our school offers this, 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 and this, and all these clubs and all these great study abroad opportunities. Well, that's not very specific. How does that make a school differentiate itself from somebody else? So it, they have to try and stand out and really highlight and focus on those things that make that institution unique to reach and really make a difference to resonate with prospective students. Next is aesthetics. Um, so students were very heavily impacted by aesthetics, uh, which was a little bit surprising to me. Um, but I had students who said, I drove up to this campus and there was a really ugly 
gate or brick wall and I didn't like it so I didn't get out of the car. Uh, so those things really do matter to students. They want to be in an environment that they feel is going to make them be happy and thrive on a day to day basis. Personal interaction. So again, getting to interact with students, faculty, staff, seeing people on campus interact with one another. Are they wearing the school colors? Are they smiling? Do they look happy? What kinds of conversations are they having? Um, a lot of people mentioned mentioned those items in their in their kind of experiences with visiting campuses. And last was the sense of community or vibe. So students mentioned that they went around kind of analyzing the hieroglyphics of the institution, looking at bulletin boards, eavesdropping on conversations, um, reading about events, um, what the weekend and nightlife was like, whether or not there was academic lectures, um, how people felt about their classes, looking at rate my professors, just really trying to get a more holistic lens of what life would be like at one school versus another school. So those are the things that really came out in my research. Um, and because of that, I was able to develop my own kind of college choice model. So I knew that people kind of made their initial college search. They immediately started by thinking about academic rigor, location, majors, reputation, all those influences that we talked about before. So all of those things went into this big funnel and then helped a student make a list of schools that they were interested in applying to, schools that they wanted to visit potentially. Um, and once they went on the campus visit, the, that's when those things really made a difference, aesthetics, personal interactions, and the community or vibe. After that, students were able to make their application decision and ultimate college choice decision. So they knew where they were admitted of the schools that they liked after campus visits and then ultimately made their college choice decision. Now, of course, not everybody does it that way. We have some students who don't visit at all until they matriculate, and we don't have students who visit until after they've been admitted um, so that it's going to be a real realistic option. But either way, once they've done those campus visits, those are the three things that kind of popped out for students along the way. So I wanted to share some of the quotes um, and things that came through during my research with actual students. I just noticed the campus was absolutely beautiful. I was just taken with how gorgeous the grounds look. When you go to college, if you don't like where you're going and if you don't feel comfortable, that's gonna affect you in every aspect of your life. And so this campus visit was really, really important to me. Definitely a deal breaker. I mean, it was so pretty out during my visit. Honestly, they had a piano in like the lobby of one of their like residence halls. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever because it was like really pretty. Like the residence halls were really nice. Also, this is kind of random, but they had a bunch of swings hanging from their trees, like rope swings. It was just like really cool, I thought. And that was like, I should go here. This is fun. Hopefully you can hear the students actually telling the quotes. Um, but I think that these are some really helpful explanations of how a student kind of saw aesthetics. Um, so again, it's if you don't like where you're going and you don't feel comfortable, that's going to affect every aspect of your life. Um, and I think a lot of times in the admission side of things, we don't think about the way high school students are thinking about college. So it's important to think about how all of those things are going to make an impact for a potential student during their actual visit. They have all kinds of people, not just what they're trying to sell. So I like that. And then, I don't know, more of just the small interactions, like seeing people, like kind of like talking to people briefly, just students that were there. That was one of the better parts for me, just seeing people walking around and looking. The excitement was there. It seemed obvious that admissions wanted to pull you in, but so did all the students here that may not have been given the fact sheet on everything that you can say about Camden University, that's great. That'll pull people in. The current students were the best salespersons. It seemed as though they wanted you to be here, which was more memorable because it was unexpected. The participants in the panels presented the message that you can do this versus we have these things that you can do. They presented the idea that you can choose your own path. You can seize opportunities that we're offering versus these are the things that if you like, you can take. It just felt more personal. And yet again, you can kind of see some of those elements of it needs to be personal. It needs to be connecting with students to really make a student interested and to think this institution is going to stand out in their memory versus another school. And then last is the community. There's like some kind of culture there, rather than it just being like a sole place where you go there, you learn a couple things here and there, and then you graduate. Like there has to be some kind of something else there, that extra oomph that gives it it. We kind of like went and sat in a coffee shop on campus for most of the schools we visited, kind of observed the students. It's sort of creepy now in retrospect, but like we just would watch them and listen in on their conversations and see like how they were interacting and like what types of people some of them were, which I thought was really helpful. 
You get so much from a college visit that you aren't able to get from information available online and on social media. So the college tour really was a valuable experience in terms of helping me learn more about a school and seeing how I would fit in that school and whether or not that school felt like it was a definite school that I would ultimately choose to attend. So again, you get to see some of that sense of community and vibe and of analyzing um, how the how those interactions go, what the culture is like, and whether a student feels like they're going to fit in or not. So how does this apply to emotional intelligence? Well, emotional intelligence is more important now than ever in selective college admission and beyond as students are moving forward into either careers or graduate school. As COVID-19 has eliminated the use of test scores or made a lot of schools consider being test optional for their past and current application cycles, colleges and universities are really refocusing their attention on a number of different soft skills, including emotional emotional intelligence, executive functioning, and attributes that allow students to interact harmoniously with others. For years, colleges and universities have placed a great deal of emphasis on a student's ability to understand and contribute to diversity, efforts in community building, grit and resilience in overcoming adversity, in addition to evaluating a student's character and impact on others. But now without testing, that focus is even more heightened. So let's take a deeper look into emotional intelligence. So emotional intelligence or EI refers to the ability for people to perceive, to control, and to evaluate their emotions. The ability to express and control personal emotions is very essential in everyday life. I told you I teach yoga. Uh, when I teach balance, I always say it's not about being perfect. You're welcome to fall out of a pose and come back in. We're learning to breathe through difficult situations. And that's a lot of what life is. Um, the ability to express and control your emotions is essential, but so is your ability to understand, interpret, and respond to the emotions of people around you, of others. Imagine a world in which you could not understand when a friend was feeling sad or when a coworker was angry or upset. That puts you in a really difficult position. Um, so we're seeing four different kind of places and key elements of emotional intelligence on this chart. First is self-awareness. So thinking about the emotional side, the accurate self-assessment, self-confidence. Then we're thinking about how that relates to what you do in self-management. So self-control, transparency, using personal initiative and drive, optimism, focusing on achievement. All of those things are important. Then for social competence, we're thinking about social awareness. So empathy, organizational awareness, focusing on service to others. And then of course, relationship management. So thinking about inspirational leadership, influencing others, developing with others, with acting as a change or a catalyst, um, dealing with conflict management, building bonds, teamwork and collaboration with others. So there's so many important elements of emotional intelligence that really play into who you are as a person and who you are when you interact with others around you. Um, so Harvard's Making Caring Common Project and Lonnie Grunier's book, The Tyranny of Meritocracy, Dem democratizing higher education in America are both really fabulous reads and definitely things that you want to explore if you haven't already. Um, but they've brought to the forefront many of the issues that have existed in admission in higher education for decades before this. Um, three main tenets and goals of this project for college admission moving forward were to develop greater concern for others and the common good among high school students, to increase equity and access for disadvantaged students, and to reduce excessive achievement pressure. Uh, there was a famous study from Chapel Hill several years ago that said students who've taken like three APs three APs versus three or more APs end up performing the same in their first two years of college. Um, and that was really groundbreaking at the time because people thought, oh, you have to do more to do more. You have to do more to be better and do more in high school to be a better student in college. And the study and the research showed that wasn't quite accurate. Um, having a couple of classes that were super challenging for a high school student, we're going to prepare them for success in college. Um, we're standing at a pretty exciting time, in my opinion, regarding the future of admission and selection, one where caring about others and the common good and embracing and learning from one another's missteps 
and an understanding of kind of fairness and learning to do what is right is more valuable now than ever. Giving students in the K-12 setting the opportunity to learn and practice social and emotional learning and to develop those skills in a, in a safe space um, with using their emotional intelligence and executive functioning is a tremendous undertaking that will ultimately yield leaders who are global citizens that strive to make our world much better than they found it. And that's really what we want at Lausanne and beyond at every institution I've worked for. That's really something that we care about. We want to develop students and people that care about the world and want to make it better than they than they found it. Um, intense achievement, pressure, particularly in affluent communities, can generate really high levels of stress. So that's obviously something that we always have to be concerned about. That stress can lead to anxiety and depression in young people. And as mentors and leaders, it's our responsibility to be mindful about how we might be contributing unknowingly to this process. So what do colleges seek? We are constantly looking for students who have the ability to influence energize and inspire others to work together to make an impact in their community. It's more than just titles held or roles played. It's about having the courage to take action. We're seeking students that demonstrate that they're a person of integrity, empathy, and humility, that they have the capacity to stand up for what is right, not what is popular, and that they think of others before thinking of themselves. The students that we seek embrace the fact that they are always learning and growing on their own personal journey. Uh, when I worked at Moorhead Kane and when I worked in scholar selection at Duke, we did this in two different ways. Uh, one, by asking students to talk about failure. Talking about personal failure is hard. Um, and the way that a student can do it or not do it well really does tell you a lot about where that person is on their emotional intelligence journey. We also ask students to paint a picture of who they were in less than 140 words. The students who used all I statements, I did this, I did that, I did this, uh, really stood out in a negative way from the students who were able to share who they were in relationship with others, how they worked on a team, et cetera. Um, this is very contrary to the way that I was taught to interview when I first got out of college. Um, I was told not to say we did this or we did that, uh, but now looking back, we really are focusing a lot more on who a person is in relationship to their to other people. So one of the things that's very important when we're thinking about the application process is storytelling. Um, it's very important because it often comes out in the college essay. That's generally the one chance that a student has to really take control of their application during their senior year because their grades are done, their re letters of recommendation, um, and their impact that they've made on the school has kind of been set to that point. So the thing that they have the most control over is that essay. And we're looking for students who think before they react, have greater self-awareness, and show empathy for others. We recommend that students listen, empathize, and really reflect on who they are as people and who they wanna be in the college admission process before choosing that college essay topic. So how can we help students um, and the ones around us to really get to the right place? Uh, we wanna teach students about empathy, teaching them to stick with challenging things, right? Life is hard. It's important to stick with things um, that are hard. It doesn't mean that you're a failure. It just means that life, we have to kind of keep pushing through sometimes in challenging situations. Using role models to teach diligence and having regular conversations with students about gratitude. I can count in my career in higher ed how many students have written me a thank you card. And I can tell you, I'm super impressed every time it happens. Um, just because, again, they went that at kind of extra, extra mile and they've really thought about how other other people impact them and their lives. And I find that often is rare um, for high school students. So as mentors, it's also important for us to regularly engage in meaningful conversations about how a student can contribute to their community, talking about making mistakes um, and talking about what was the best part of your day, what was the hardest, just those generic kind of Short conversations can really help a student to kind of think through things in a different way and really develop relationships to other people. 
Also, it's important for us to think about our personal messaging. Instead of saying the most important thing is that you're happy and successful, right? The most important thing is that you're kind and happy. Uh, making caring and justice a focus and teaching students self-control. So next is caring as a mentor. We want to keep the focus on your student, taking time to listen, checking out your blind spots, and being alert to red flags. Don't confuse your personal interests with a student's. Reflect on your assumptions about good colleges. Um, you know, I work at ECU now and I absolutely love it, but a number of people in the state of North Carolina would say ECU is a party school. Um, I say that you can make any school a party school and you can get a great education at ECU. We have a fabulous honors college and a really great research and doctoral program for students to think about as well. Um, but again, sometimes those tiny assumptions or feeling like I need to have this certain school to share with my friends um, at a cocktail party to impress them really Really puts people in the wrong place when thinking about college. Um, I, for my own personal journey, if I had known I was going to keep getting so many degrees, right, I would have considered applying for many, many more scholarships for my undergraduate experience because education is quite frankly expensive and you have to think about those things. I want you to encourage students to contribute to others. High school students in the middle and upper class communities can often be caught up in a kind of Community Service Olympics. They believe that in order to get an edge in their application, they have to start a new project or a new business or donate $10,000 to something randomly. Uh, they need to go to a faraway country or tackle some formidable problem. But these factors don't really determine the value of service. Um, using college admission as an opportunity for ethical education, be honest about inequality. Acknowledge that college admission is a game. Um, on some days at Duke, uh, the admission staff might be too hungry or too thirsty and not in a good mood um, when they're reading or making a decision about a file. It's human nature. Um, admission is not, luckily, a science, um, but because of that, there is human error and there is a human element and bias to the process. Much as we try to remove it, um, it certainly does happen. And then last is just encouraging gratitude. So again, going back to that because everybody should be learning to be thankful for the opportunities that they have. So how can we turn this to the college application process and how can you put this to work in that setting? So first is compassion. So again, Compassion is concern for the welfare of others that's evoked by perceiving another individual as struggling or in some kind of need. So what can a student do to kind of develop their compassion skills? Um, activities like a student volunteers um, in an elderly home. Um, they have limited extracurricular activities because of family responsibilities. Or perhaps a recommendation letter mentions that a student frequently shows care for other students. And it's genuine. They are tutoring, mediating, understanding different viewpoints or personal struggles, maybe bringing a, a student into, the, into a conversation that's frequently left out. This is the kind of student that's looking out for other people and those around them. And that's very impressive to us in the college application process. Next is curiosity. So curiosity is the desire to learn and understand new things and how they work. We know Lausanne students are very curious, uh, but we can show this in the application when students who join groups to learn more about people of different backgrounds and maybe different backgrounds from themselves. They pursue the opportunity to shadow a professional in a field they're interested in, or maybe a recommendation letter mentions that they consistently act ask probing intellectual questions. They're always kind of moving that discussion forward. They're the kind of student that a teacher loves to have in the classroom and they're super engaged and super excited. And I think that's something that we're always looking for in a potential student. Next is that growth mindset. A growth mindset is a belief that intelligence and talents can advance through perseverance and dedication. Um, a student can show this by a long-term dedication to an activity. We love to see that, um, a student that's really passionate about it, about something. That's not to say that we don't like a student that dabbles in a lot of things, we certainly do. Uh, but I think showing that you're really developing and growing over time in an activity is also helpful. So a student who might have thrived after constructive criticism in an activity or the classroom, or doesn't back down from a challenge, all of those are really helpful things as well to see in the process. 
Next is purpose. So purpose can be defined as a stable and generalized intention to accomplish something that is at the same time meaningful to the self and consequential for the world beyond the self. Activities that are tied to future goals, futuristic goals, or the desire to learn for future goals, sincere and continual interest in solving problems or achieving long-term goals um, can also be demonstrated and shown in recommendation letters and be really helpful for us in the process. So that was a lot that I threw at you. I hope that you, you learned a little bit, um, you thought and reflected a little bit about how we can kind of see this interplay of the two together. The college admission process can be stressful, can be intimidating, and can be very overwhelming for a high school student. Um, but really focusing on that emotional intelligence component as a parent and as a mentor uh, will really help your student to kind of be able to accept any difficulties that come along the way, and also to learn more about who they are and want to be in life. So with that, um, I will be happy to take any questions that anybody might have. Um, thank you again for listening to my presentation. Thank you, Justine. That was awesome. Um, I always feel like I learn so much and also think back to um, I'm close to the same class as you, like the college admission process when we were in high school, again, like you said, was very focused on like I statements and filling, I felt like I had to fill my extracurriculars with everything. And I had never even thought about like, who do they think I am as a person? So I, I love not only learning from you, but seeing how this process has grown and gotten better over the years too. So thank you. Of course. All right. And if anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to either put them in the chat or just shout them out. This is Kalyan. Hey, thanks again, Justin, for doing this. This was um, very good. And uh, just to add, I, I guess I have a question and just a comment. First, I'll start with the comment. Sorry about that. Start with the comment. Um, you know, I, I work for a local company here, which is, I won't name my company here because it's probably not appropriate, but it's the big one in the, in the city. So you can guess which it is. But wanted to comment that emotional intelligence and you know how it ties to management and leadership is so important for our company that it's one of the mandatory courses if you want to get into leadership and management. So I'm glad to see that it ties into the university education and what universities are looking for in their you know potential students. So that's great to see. Uh, my question is, of course, you know I didn't grow up in the states. I came here for my master's, so the whole undergrad, you know, admission process is completely new to me. You mentioned some very good things about, you know, what you're looking for in your potential student, showing compassion, curiosity, growth mindset, purpose. You know, some of those, of course, you know, would reflect in their grades and the courses they've taken and how they've done and some of the activities. But how does the student, I guess, articulate some of the finer points about showing compassion is that primarily through the essay or how do they do that? That's a great question. I think it's a lot. It comes out in several different ways. Um, so I think the student can only do so much, but I think thinking about the way the essays are going to come off is very important. But there's also a lot of short answer um, explanations on every application, and there's usually more than one essay. Um, so again, you can kind of get a sense for a student's personality and who they are with other people. Because I've also worked in the scholarship realm, I've worked in an area where there's been a lot uh, more different essays, um, video essays, um, and components to an application that you get, really get to know a student and kind of what makes them tick and who they're all about. Um, but again, I think that those recommendation letters also help. I think it can be really helpful for a student to remind a teacher or a counselor or anybody that's writing a reference letter for them about kind of stories rather than just giving your resume say, you know, I, I thought you would be a really good choice for me because I was struggling when I started in Latin initially. Um, and then, you know, I ended up getting an A in the class or, you know, I did this or that in that particular club or organization. So kind of reminding them of some of those different places where, uh, in, not in a braggadocious kind of way, but in a way to say, this is why I thought you would be a good fit to kind of share this part of my, who I am as a person. Um, I think the student only gets to craft, like I said, so much um, in their story, but I think so much of that 
so much of what makes an impact does come from those recommendation letters and those teachers and counselors um, and extracurricular leaders and people outside the school are making an impression about your student every day. So that's why I say I think it's very important to be thinking about emotional intelligence and how to react to setbacks and how to support other people and how it, we are so interconnected and it is so important to be there for others that having those conversations at home and on a regular basis makes a big difference because those students inevitably are going to act differently um, in a lot of social settings as well as educational settings than students who aren't having those conversations. If it's okay, I'd love to share and just kind of echo what Justine said. So um, I'm Laurie Gray. I'm one of the uh, co-directors of college advising here at Lausanne. Um, and we do offer the opportunity for the students um, in their junior year when they're making the selections about who they want to write their recommendation letters in the faculty. They um, do something that we call a fun fact sheet and they talk specifically for each teacher about what they um, would like for them to say, reminders, just like Justine said, um, about you know a, um, an experience that they had in the class, experience they had with them, um, and they have a lot of opportunity. There's no uh, word limit <laughs> on that, so they can really share those experiences and um, and reminders for those teachers as they're writing their letters. And also, I mean, just the opportunity if the schools allow it. You know, like she mentioned about the um, the videos, like Wash U is an example that allows a 90 second video or an interview. So I think anytime. Our students are so well prepared to really share their stories that I think if they're given that opportunity, we really encourage that. And um, Charlotte Albertson helps tremendously with interview prep for that as well. Thanks, Laurie. Absolutely. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, so I was just going to ask a question that kind of echoes that question maybe from the like from the what can parents do to kind of encourage highlighting those things I know as a person who really hates talking about myself um I have a hard time with that so when you're thinking about like the situation that students are in and how they're highlighting and they're they're at school and they're talking to their teachers um and I totally agree like the mock interviews that we do, I mean, the, the, the little sheets, they're awesome. What can parents kind of do to not only instill those, those qualities at home, but to make sure that students are comfortable talking about those things rather than I got all A's and I got this score on this. I think it goes back to a couple of things. I think first I'm thinking about those conversations just about the at home on a regular daily basis. Like, how was your day? What things went well? What things didn't go well? What things would you have changed if you could have? Um, just having some of those reflective conversations, I think is really helpful. Um, but then also having experiences, whether they're in the Memphis community. And like I said, volunteering or getting out there or getting involved with something outside of the school, um, I think can be helpful. I danced a lot with Ballet Memphis. So I was interacting with students from other schools all the time. Um, or maybe it's going and going to a camp or just be putting yourself in a different situation where you're not necessarily so comfortable and kind of learning about yourself and what things did you learn and what things do you want to grow and what are your interests? I think, you know, talking to students about their interests and how they develop over time. I can tell you when I was at Lausanne, I wanted to be a Navy SEAL, a rocket, um, an interior designer, a lawyer, like a lot of things. Uh, I think that's pretty normal, right? So uh, talking about those, believing in those things, not necessarily shutting them down um, and just kind of helping them to think about what things about that kind of excite you, uh, but constantly kind of being in those conversations that aren't just about, I don't know, drama or, uh, you know, I don't know, just like what's happening on the weekend or staying on that shallow level, like trying to get deep with students, because again, they want to get deep with, with one another, another, but I also think it can be really helpful for them to turn to their peers for some of that feedback. I often recommend to students when they're writing an essay to show it to at least three or four of their friends and ask them, you know, Hey, if I pick this essay randomly up off of the floor, would you know, it was about me? Like, would you know that I wrote this? Um, 
Or would you say 50,000 other students might have written the same essay about the, the marching band, um, for, for example? So thinking about how to make yourself stand out, what makes you different and what makes you tick? And I think students do a good job of helping to point those things out to one another. Sometimes there's things that are so intrinsic to our personality that we don't realize them until someone else points them out. Um, so I think parents and mentors and role models and teachers can be a great place for that to say, you know, this is something that's really incredible about you. I read, I read for QuestBridge um, as well, the scholarship. And one of the questions that they ask that I find the answer to be fascinating is, um, what is the best compliment you've ever received? It's fascinating to hear that answer, right? So I think just asking those questions, getting to know the students as well as you can and kind of pushing them again to think about who they are and what want to be because that changes on a daily basis, um, but that really helps them to kind of navigate the process and find a school and find a career ultimately that they're gonna be happy in. Because again, things change. Most people don't stay in the same job for forever. So you have to be able to constantly self- analyze and assess things that hopefully every job you're getting more of the things you like and less of the things you don't. I tell all of my staff, I have a team of 18, that every day, like this isn't gonna be your forever job. I hope you have a great experience and I hope you get to pursue a master's, a doctoral degree, you know, professional associations or conferences or networking, but this isn't your forever job. So get out of it what you can, Think about what you like, keep taking note of those things, and think about how you can have more of that in the next job and next opportunity. I don't know if I answered your question, but I tried. You definitely did. And it kind of, um, no, it made me think too of like that idea of like, what's the best compliment you've ever received? Um, mine, I'm happy to share. It's really funny. Um, a person one time in my graduate program, um, I'm trying to finish up my dissertation, said, you know, you just remind me of a human tea cozy. <laughs> at first I was like, what? And they were like, no, no, no. It's just, you always are so like, like cute, but like warm and fun. And I just like want you in my house. And like, that was such just like a nice, I would not have, when she said it, I was like, what? That's super weird. But like that has stuck with me. I mean, that was probably 10 years ago. It was when I was in my master's and it stuck with me the whole time. And that idea of this doesn't have to be your forever thing. I think our students and our parents get very anxious about like college choice and this determines your whole life. And in some ways that's true. And in some ways it's, it's what those core elements of yourself are. So you definitely answered my question and kind of gave me a lot to think about. Like, I wonder what my daughter's greatest compliment that she's ever gotten so far. She's a freshman this year. So that's really interesting. The other thing I was going to add, I hate to keep speaking up, but <laughs> um, is one thing that I've recommended to parents, and I think you could start this earlier than high school for sure, but to lay aside uh, some time one day a week, whether that's Sunday supper or whatever, that you go around the table and ask your kids and you, you respond as well as a parent. Like, what's the thing that surprised you this week? What are you, what are you thinking? Like, where, you know, do you have new goals this week? And maybe it's their goals for finishing out freshman year or sophomore year or whatever. Um, but really just kind of opening those lines of communication, because I think anytime a student is asked about college, you know, if they're a freshman and they're already being asked about college, I think it just becomes a stressor. And to be able to have that conversation that be very natural and start earlier I think is so helpful. At least I, I find it to be now my kids are seven and 11, so <laughs> we'll see how it carries into high school. But I think just kind of starting that sort of tradition and it not, you know, that by, by the time it gets to junior year and it really becomes more about making that selection, they're so used to having these kinds of conversations that it's very easy to continue to communicate with their parents about what they're thinking and not become such a stress point. Um, so that's just some recommendations I've made to some of our families. I love that. We call it, uh, we did it with my tour guides. We used to call it rose, thorn, and pineapple. Like rose is the best thing. Thorns, like the kind of pain in your butt for the week. Um, and the pineapple is the thing that surprised you the most. I love it. <laughs> that's such a great, like way to make that activity not feel like oppressive to like, tell me everything about your week. Yeah. Like, I don't want to interrogate my kid, but I love that idea of like those open-ended questions too. So 
Awesome. Well, does anyone have any other questions? I want to be respectful of everyone's time this evening. All right. Well, if we don't, Greg, I see you just unmuted. Do you have a question? I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming and thank Justine. And we're probably going to hit you up again next year. <laughs> we'll get the trifecta three, three in a row. <laughs> I know the community is like a prize. We'll send you a, a new, some new laws and gear. Yes. <laughs> I'll do anything for swag. So you got it. It's on the way. <laughs> awesome. Well, Justine, thank you so much. As always, I always feel not just like I learned a lot, but I always feel very like less anxious and calm after this. Um, it's also nice to see uh, the process behind somebody else's doctoral work as somebody who's working on mine. Um, you make it sound very step-by-step step, and as I'm <laughs> rewriting 800 footnotes right now, I just, I very much appreciate that. So thank you so much for being here. Um, so I saw you put some links in the chat for um, books and articles, and I will also share those um, when I send the recording out. If anyone has any questions or needs anything, of course, you know how to get a hold of me. Um, I'll also make sure that everyone has the recording this week. And thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you so much.